me start off a bit. I'll remind you of what we've done. So uh, remember that we, we the main part of the, uh, the presentation last time, we uh, started with physical sensors. You can kind of look at the outline on the uh, left side here. I started with physical sensors, and then the idea was to describe virtual sensors, which are a mathematical abstraction of the information that we get from sensors. So the idea for that is that uh, we want to define a physical state space, which is enough of a description so that when we have the physical state, we should be able to predict exactly what the sensor is going to give us. Right? It doesn't mean we get to have the state when we use the sensor, but the sensor gets to have it because the sensor just transforms somehow the, the, um, the physical state into an observation. And in the process, it usually loses a lot of information. So I gave you a lot of examples after that, after the sensor mapping was covered. Sensor mapping looks like that. H goes from X to Y. X is the state space. Y is the observation space. And remember that, as I said near the end last time, that the sensor mapping partitions the state space into equivalent classes, much like uh, slicing up a bunch of bread uh, in the morning, for example, when, when you have your breakfast. Um, so hopefully you were thinking about pre images right, when, when, when eating breakfast. Let's see. So um, there's one pre-image or one slice for every observation, and then we have a partition that's induced by um, by every um, sensor mapping H. We get a partition of the state space, and that corresponds to what level of resolution, if you like, that the sensor can observe the state space or observe the state. Um, so I did jump a little bit over some stuff last time. I want to continue where I left off. So you may remember that I had um, detection sensors like these kind. But uh, let me jump up here, detection sensors. Uh, I covered depth sensors. Remember that they look like this. We talked about uh, the robot looking at the wall and measuring the distance. We had detection sensors, which are very much like visibility sensors, where you have some bodies in the field of view. Remember the, idea, the general idea of bodies from last time? And then we have uh, relational sensors I talked about. Remember that, for example, these give you a permutation, right? Now you can also think about pre-images. I guess for this we have five factorial pre-images, correct? Right, five factorial sets. So this will, if you take an arrangement of points here, suppose they're all inside of the field of view of the camera, because some of them would leave, I guess, in general, but if they're all inside the field of view, and, and, if, and if we don't have one directly in front of the other, we have to define what happens in that case. That's um, it's called general position assumptions in computational geometry, right? So as long as you don't have that, you're going to get five factorial pre-images that correspond to exactly how those are arranged. Right, so those are the things we have. Um, I want to introduce some, some more sensors now, uh, just a little bit more, and then, and then I'll jump to, to later stuff. So something called gap sensors I think is interesting. Um, here's the idea. So we have the visibility area um, via Q. So maybe it looks like this. There's some kind of region like this that is a visibility region. It can depend on your configuration. That's fine. If it, the robot's moving around with such a sensor. And then I take a look at the boundary of that. So the boundary is this, the boundary of V of U. And um, what happens with, this, with these regions, you may have noticed this, you certainly notice this in pursuitivation problems, is that when I go around, when I move around the boundary here, parts of the boundary correspond to the obstacle, and parts of the boundary correspond to the free space. Right? So maybe the the obstacle comes in here and then occupies part of this and then comes back out and maybe comes in here again, right? All right, so that's something you might have noticed in pursuit of Asian problems, right? That this may be a visibility region. This is drawn somewhat abstractly here. It be any kind of region you like. And then these are the obstacle regions. So when we just consider the interval, what you get is an al a, a kind of sequence, right? There's an alternating sequence here of this part of your visibility region has some extra part here that you can't see, you can't sense, right? It's in the free space. Now there's an obstacle, and now there's a part over here, right? And then there's an obstacle, and there's a part over here. Understand? So that's going to be the basic idea of gap sensors. I call, I call that a, it comes from the idea of discontinuities in depth or, or in alternations of these boundaries. So let me show you some examples of that. I think they're, they're quite uh, interesting and useful. So start with a visibility sensor that measures distances perfectly in all directions. So that's the omnidirectional um, distance sensor. And we can make something called a simple gap sensor. Let's say um, we'll refer to this region here as B0, which is just the, uh, the, the main obstacle region. That's one obstacle, right? The whole obstacle is connected. And then 
When we put this sensor in, notice that we have these gaps here called uh, G1 through G5. Gap means discontinuity, right? So just a gap in the, in the distance measurement. So what this sensor could provide is, is a reading like this, which is as I sweep around 360 degrees, what I get is this kind of alternating sequence. First I hit the, bound, the, the, um, the obstacle, B0. Then I see gap one, right up there at the top. Then I see the obstacle again, then I see gap two, then obstacle, gap three, obstacle, gap four, obstacle, gap five. Right? And then it comes back around to obstacle again. Um, so that's, that's an example of information that you get from a gap sensor. And I think that encodes something very useful. Um, in fact, that's one of the critical things that was needed for pursuit evasion in, in a visibility-based pursuit evasion algorithm with omnidirectional visibility. Um, and I'll also show some other interesting things you can do with these kinds of um, abstract sensors. Um, you may have noticed that the B0s here seem like they're providing uh, no significant information, right? So we may just want to write this kind of sensor's output like this. Just G1, G2, G3, G4, G5, because it's always going to be an alternating sequence of obstacle and the boundary, obstacle and, and, and gaps. So we might as well just eliminate the B0s here. But I will keep them in general because we may have more complicated things. Like for example, suppose now that the sensor has limited depth. Right? So the sensor has a limited range, and it's still an omnidirectional 360 degree sweep. So in that case, we may have two different kinds of gaps. You may have these gaps that are discontinuities in depth, but you also have gaps like this. You can call these fat gaps if you want. So this is like a fat gap that corresponds to some part of the environment that's over here, but um, you cannot sense beyond this limit. So this is like an artificial boundary that's created by the limit of your sensing range. So if that's the case, if I sweep around here, I get some sequence that looks like this. And now I had better be careful about the B0s. And I have capital letters for the fat gaps, let's say, and lowercase letters for the thin gaps. But does that make sense? I'm just trying to come up with what I think should feel like a nice you know, computational geometry-like or a combinatorial representation of, of, of how this kind of sensor might work. Right? That information is quite useful. It's telling us a lot, even if I do not give you anything other than this information, right? If you're familiar with, um, I don't know, say, um, uh, computing arrangements in combinational geometry, right? There, there's, there's very important combinatorial information encoded in, in, in the sequence. When you, when, you when you take a line that intersects a, another collection of lines, the ordering of the line intersections is very important, right? So I just think this, this ordering that you get, this is a sequence, this ordering that you get, in this case, it is a circular sequence, tells you something very important about the, the, maybe the structure of the environment, or maybe your ability to observe bodies that are moving around, or your ability to play pursuit of vision with this kind of sensor. That's the critical information in some sense that it has. Excuse me. Yes? Isn't it important which obstacle you're facing? Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's very nice. So if you're in, a, in a, an environment that is not simply connected, I think, I think my next slide has that, so let's see. Um, yeah, here's one. So here's one with multiple obstacles, right? You could do this in many ways, okay? So, so it could be the case that maybe your sensor is smart enough to know that these are different edges of the polygon, right? And then you could list the edge names in here. That's probably hard to do because with a lot of sensors, if you just have a, some kind of generic visibility sensor, it's probably hard for it to know exactly which edge is which. So that's why I did not include that as a kind of example, but, but the definition could allow that. Or maybe, um, there are different obstacles like this, right? So now the obstacles are ellipsoids, or ellipses. And in that case, maybe each one has a unique label, B1, B2, B3, and B4. And then we just put that into the sequence. And in this case, this example has a limited angle range. So now, this is not a circular ordering. I should be careful about that. These previous ones, this one was a circular ordering. The previous one before that was a circular ordering. So this is a sequence, but um, I could have written G3, G4, G5, G1, G2, the same thing. So there's an equivalence relation because it's uh, cyclic. But this one is not cyclic, and I'm just saying, look, if you sweep across from, uh, which way do we go? Oh, from right to left, right? So we sweep across from right to left. Um, uh, we, 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 we go the, uh, the Farsi reading way, right? Um, then then we, uh, we get exactly this. Uh, big G1, then little G1, then D4. It's very interesting in the case of B5, note that um, uh, B5 and B4, um, B5 is in front of B4, so B4 will show up twice, right? So that's a very interesting structure, so it's giving you something. For example, imagine I have a robot that just moves around at random with this kind of sensor. 
I command it just to do some kind of random walks or brownie in motion. I don't care, something like that. It goes moving around in a crazy way, but it has this kind of sensor. So here's a question. What can it learn about the environment? Right? Um, can it tell something about the arrangement of those, of those uh, ellipses in this case? Right? So I think it's a very interesting kind of question. So based on this information alone, assuming it does not give precise distances or angles or anything, it just has this data, what can it learn? Right? Yes? Yeah. Um, if you so so I, I I think and we're going to get to this in a little bit when we compare the power of sensors. Um, you will make a weaker sensor by doing it. So it'll be a perfectly fine sensor, but I would argue that you lose information. Um, there's 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 one here, here's one way to lose information. I could imagine all five of those obstacles are indistinguishable because they're just bodies as well. And as I said, bodies could be indistinguishable. So then these are just B, right? They just say B. And so that would be weaker already because I'm confused about which obstacle is which. Then I can make it even weaker by using your suggestion and deleting the Bs. Um, so that would give some information about gaps, but I would have a very hard time knowing um, how the environment is structured. Right? I might not know if um, all of it is just one. Yeah, so what would it give me? It would still give me a sequence of oh, thin gaps and fat gaps. That's very interesting. Let's see. Um, so you want to leave the big Gs and the little Gs, right? Maybe? And just delete the, the, the Bs. Um, yeah, probably if I, if I made the obstacles indistinguishable, then that may be equivalent to just deleting the Bs after that. And I have to think about it, but you know, once, once you make these no longer distinguishable, the capital Bs, then probably deleting the Bs that remain um, does not lose information, I think. I think the main thing is that it's helping to distinguish between which obstacles have been hit. That's an interesting point. I have to think about it, but I'm not, I haven't thought as carefully about the interaction between fat gaps and thin gaps. I have to think about that. These are very pretty structures, though, I feel like, you know, very interesting things to study. Um, they're not really studied, I think. I don't know if anybody's doing this. Um, another one you can make in, that's related to the gap sensor is, um, um, let's say, a landmark counter. Suppose there's landmarks on the walls. In this case, maybe they're like um, the red dots in this room might be like these black speakers up here, see? The black speakers, I see four of them. They all look the same but they're just distributed along the walls in some way. So imagine these, are, these red dots are like the black speakers distributed around. So maybe the sensor gives me the following information. It tells me how many um, landmarks there are um, along the portions of the boundary that, um, that the sensor re region hits, right? So, so this, in other words, along these parts extracted, these red parts here, that, that hit the boundary of my visibility region or detection region, um, how many landmarks are there? So if that's the case, I get a sequence like this for this example. I think three corresponds to the upper one there. And then I see another three. There's four here. That's the four. There's zero on this one. So that's zero. And then there's one over here. Um, that, that model actually is very similar. I say equivalent, but it's, a, I think, a little bit more general. Then a model used by these guys, um, it's called the um, combinatorial visibility vector. Um, the authors of this work, I did not write all of them, sorry about that, but the authors are uh, Subhash Suri. Uh, you may have heard of Subhash Suri. He's done uh, his friend, his friend, his most, some of the most famous work in computational geometry was on the, uh, I think he killed the continuous Dijkstra problem, if I'm not mistaken. This is the, the best result you're ever going to get on that. Uh, but I have a, a collaboration with him. I, he, it was very funny, he was talking about this to me, and uh, he said, you, 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 you know, it's unfortunate if you're the person who provides the, the best results. Because then that field is dead, and then nobody else will cite your paper, right? So, so like, it's better to provide the first result, which is not too good, and then you can get famous because everyone will try to show how smart they are and try to improve it, right? So, so something interesting. It's kind of funny. And he's a very funny guy. But I thought it was interesting. Um, I think one of the other authors is Peter uh, Widmar. Um, maybe, maybe you've heard of him as well. So he does uh, theoretical computer science. He's at um, ETH in Zurich. Um, so I just kind of changed their model a little bit. Theirs was based on how many vertices you can, are inside of each one of these regions here. How many vertices, like there's one vertex here, and there's one vertex here, and there's zero here. They call it a combinatorial visibility vector. I generalize that to just abstract landmarks. So to make it equivalent to their definition, you can put one vertex, uh, one, one landmark per vertex, and then it'll look the same as theirs. But I think this is a little more general. So, uh, so those are some examples. And uh, I'll show you some interesting kinds of things you can do with these gaps. Uh, any more questions about that? I think field 
sensors are very interesting. They probably do not look as combinatorial as you may be accustomed to, but uh, they don't look so computational geometry-like. But I want to cover them just a little bit. Um, Excuse me. Yes. Uh, can you tell me what's the difference between depth sensor and the normal sensor? Uh, like a detection sensor or a depth sensor? Yes. Um, well, eventually we're going to get to this thing called the sensor lattice, which is going to show the relationship between different sensors. And I hope that will give you a very good feeling of how things are related. If I have the omnidirectional depth sensor, I could calculate the gaps from that, right? So that means that somehow the, the omnidirectional gap sensor is, or sorry, the omnidirectional distance sensor, depth sensor, is strictly more powerful, right? However, you, you, you may have a weaker sensor, maybe using a camera or something, and it can just detect where these discontinuities are, and that's all, right? So, so it's, it's less information. And even better, maybe you're going to make a filter or a planning algorithm that uses information. And it decides to even drop all the depth information and only use this gap information because it's determined that that's enough for the task. So that leads to a simpler algorithm, right? So same kind of thing you may see in computational geometry where uh, a clever computational geometer will determine only the critical information that needs to be maintained in a data structure rather than too much, right? Which, which may then lead to um, a higher complexity for no reason, right? The same kind of thing is happening here in that you want to find just very small amounts of information to carry along and it turns out this gap information will be sufficient for some very interesting things. Is that okay? Thank you very much. All right, uh, field sensors. So suppose you have a vector field like this. Let's just stay on a plane, so we're in a two-dimensional environment. Uh, here's how a vector field might look. It a, has a two-dimensional vector at every point. So, yeah, I can just make a sensor that says, all right, if, I, if my robot is somewhere in the environment here, or a sensor is somewhere in the environment, so I have a position and an angle, let's say, then I just directly observe the field. Now, there's something that's a bit wrong with that, I think, and I want to improve this a little bit. If I'm just out in the environment and I observe the vector field, do you think I'm going to observe the same vector when I'm facing this way versus this way? Right? Depends on the vector field, I suppose, but probably not, right? Usually vector field observations, you may expect that they will be relative to your particular orientation. But what if you don't know your particular orientation? It's going to be relative to that anyway. You, know, you cannot help it. Like if you carry a compass around, the compass, right, which, which, which gives you orientation, is going to be based on magnetic fields, right, the natural magnetic fields of the Earth. And so that's some vector field that you're trying to observe to determine something about your orientation. So it's very interesting. It may teach you something about your orientation. So it's very important to be careful with orientations. That's one of the things I want to say about field sensors. And um, There's always this uh, theta parameter here um, expressing the orientation in, in basic mobile robotics and, and sensors and those sort of things. And uh, very often, you don't know which direction you're facing. Um, so here's some examples I can make. So, so even without worrying about direction yet, let's suppose I make some scale of them. So if I don't care about my direction, I could have a sensor that just observes. Oh, whoops, went too far. Let's see. No, I didn't. OK, F. Oh, okay. oh uh, F is. Oh, sorry. OK, good. I'm, I forgot my F function. So F is just a field, right? So, so F is the field. Um, so this is F sub 1 and F sub 2 are just the components of the field at that point B. Uh, all right. And then um, I could have um, a sensor that just directly observes the intensity, right? So it just observes the magnitude of the field. Maybe I have something like an intensity alarm. It could be a binary sensor that just tells me, one, if the intensity is too large, right? Like maybe it's a microphone and it, and it tells you whenever the sound is above some saturation, right? So that would be fine. You can imagine sound waves propagating through the, through the room. And that may be an intensity alarm, let's say. It just tells me whatever it's above a threshold. Um, here's another one. Um, I could take, I could make these a little more general. I kind of like this. This reminds me of, um, I, I like playing with satellite dishes. I know, of course, nobody here has a satellite dish. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, whenever, whenever you move the dish around, um, you, you, you have to uh, you know, watch the needle moving, right? And so, but what's interesting is you do not get the direct intensity. When you do this, you don't really, this is like some arbitrary scale from 0 to 10. You don't care about what the exact measurements are, the actual what, units of energy of some electromagnetic waves or something. I, we don't care. All you care about is it getting bigger or smaller, right? Um, so, so really what's happening is you have an unknown monotonically increasing function that is distorting the magnitude, right? So that's how it goes. Whenever you do something like this, that's what's going on, right? You don't care about the actual units. You can just imagine there's some function distorting. Maybe it's a linear function, hopefully, but, but you know, it might not be. I don't know. So I, I think it's kind of neat to think that you can have transformed intensity, and that 
will tell you a lot, right? Um, it's still a very useful kind of sensor to have. Um, the other thing, as I said, when I, when I went to the first slide here, is I said that, you know, based on your position, um, the, the vector that you observe should depend on your orientation as well. It did not in this model. If you want to fix that, it's very simple. You just add a rotation matrix here. Um, so let's say R sub phi would be a two by two rotation matrix. Put it in here, and then imagine you get an observation that depends on your orientation. So it's depending on theta, right? So, 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 the, so the observation you get ends up being, being rotated. You get a rotated version of the vector because it has to undo, that's why it's minus theta, undo your particular orientation. So that corresponds more naturally, I think. And then as I said, there's these weird cases of based on which is known or unknown, you get some constraints, right? So let's suppose the vector field is given and you don't know your orientation, then you can determine your orientation if you make an observation because you can just reconstruct it from the, from the equation. If um, your orientation is known but f is unknown, then you can determine what the value of the vector field is. So, so it's kind of nice. It's just, just always remember there's an extra piece of information that's what's your orientation. And if you're given one, you can determine the other. It's kind of an interesting thing. It's a very, very robotics kind of thing. If you're familiar with robotics experiments, mobile robots out in the field somewhere, you, you kind of know this. If you're more familiar with um, let P be a polygon and then do visibility things, you might not think about this, right? So, so I'm just kind of pointing out the very robotic -y kind of thing. Um, for example, you can make a compass like this. Um, this is a vector field. This is how the vector field should look for the magnetic field of the Earth. Um, of course, it does not. If you, if you look at the beautiful maps, they're all off by certain angles and such. Do you have any idea how much the magnetic fields are off in comparison to true north in Iran? I don't know. In, in the place where I live in the U.S., I know they're off by about two or three degrees because I was using that to help, help align satellite missions, which you know nothing about. But, all right. And, 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 so, and so, 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 so the vector fields are like this, I guess, ideally. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm drawing here, right? So, uh, so the vector fields like that, what I would like to have is a sensor that can, um, when the robot is facing some orientation, it looks at the difference in angles, right? And it tries to calculate then what the direction is of the robot. So that's just an ideal compass. It's just taking the arc tangent, right, of the, of the vector field and then reconstructing the angle from that. So, so that's how you would implement an ideal compass, relying on the fact that you have some vector field that you presumably know. We don't care about the magnitude of it actually here, but, but at least you know that it's presumably you know the direction and it should be pointing always north. All right. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about that. I gave you pre images last time. I will say a little bit more about that. Uh, remember the slices of bread? And I gave some examples. This one, by the way, I'm still very interested in. If any of you did your homework last night and you have some more ideas about how to solve this problem of characterizing these pre-images for these kind of examples when you're given a polygon, I'd love to hear about it, uh, maybe during the break. Uh, here's the next thing I want to give, and this will hopefully, uh, the question you asked a bit ago uh, about uh, how, um, how are the sensors related? So, one thing somebody might want to think about is, um, is that sensor better than that sensor, right? And if the sensors just look like, um, I don't know, pictures of sensors, it's hard to answer questions like that. It's better because why? I don't know, it's more reliable, it uses less energy, um, I, I like the brand name better, it makes me feel good. I have no idea, right? But if I go to virtual sensors, these kind of models I've been giving you, I can make very rigorous comparisons between the different sensors. And at least in this beautiful family of um, called the sensor lattice that I want to, that I want to try to show you. Um, so first of all, let's suppose we have a state space task. We just fix that. So we have a state space. Um, it could be um, it could be SE2, the set of all uh, rigid body two-dimensional translations and rotations. Maybe there's an environment E. Maybe you don't know the environment, but whatever. Just fix it, and then everything else is going to be variable. Now I take any two sensors, let's say, X goes to Y1 and X goes to Y2. These are H1 and H2. I take any two sensors. Um, here's a very interesting thing that's going to happen. I'll say that H1 dominates H2 if and only if the partition due to H1 is a refinement of the partition due to H2. Um, is everyone familiar with partition refinements? Right. So if I, if I take a partition, let me just draw it real quick over here. So if I start off with a set, Good. If I start off with a set, 
and then I have a partition of it. Right? So imagine I'm drawing some kind of partition. And refinement is another partition which I can only obtain by partitioning the elements of the partition. Right? So by breaking them down into smaller sets. Uh, so maybe I uh, draw a line here and another one here and some other one here. So that would be a refinement. Um, a, a partition is technically a refinement of itself. That's okay too. So that, that, that case is fine. But every other refinement has to be. So I can keep chopping and chopping and chopping. In terms of bread, it means what? In terms of a loaf of bread. You take the slices that somebody made and you keep breaking them down further, right? To little bite sized pieces, right? So, so, very nice. so maybe you go all the way down to the level of bread crumbs, right? So you can go all the way down. That's what refinement is. So if I look at these partitions, then um, I'll say that H1 dominates H2 if and only if this one's made out of smaller bread pieces than this one, right? But I got these bread pieces by breaking the bread pieces of this one. That's, that's the idea. Um, why that? Let me show you why. Well, because what happens is, if that happens, then I can simulate H2, the weaker one, by only using the observations from H1. Remember when I just said, I was answering your question about, about the, the, the gap sensor, you could, you could obtain what the gap sensor should output by using just the output of the omnidirectional depth sensor. In that case, H1 would be omnidirectional depth sensor, and H2 would be the gap sensor. So you can get it exactly like that. And um, so, so, so this, this diagram here shows this very nicely. Um, so I have H2 here, it produces Y2. This is the weaker sensor. And then I have H1 going this way, which is my stronger sensor. What that, that relationship um, means is that there exists a function G that maps from Y1 to Y2. And I can use that to transform the outputs. Um, because if I'm over here, right, and, and I, I apply uh, H1, the powerful sensor, that puts me here, right? So I can reconstruct which slice of the original bread I came from and then figure out what I should output. Is that nice? And that means I never have to go back and measure the state. So I think it's a very powerful idea that you can substitute one sensor for another. I'd like you to think about that, and uh, that's going to be important through the rest of the, the short course here, um, in that um, we may always ask for a particular robotic system, can I replace this sensor with another one, right? So take one of your favorite pursuit of Asian algorithms for a moment, and, and maybe you have an omnidirectional visibility sensor. Can you replace that with a gap sensor and have it still work? You, know, you can ask this question now about anything. And, and so, uh, well, the answer is no, because it goes in the wrong direction. Maybe it works, but this theory will not do it for you. But if you have a method that uses the gap sensor, then you can clearly replace it with the more powerful sensor. One bit, bit of a warning, that's only if you can compute G efficiently. Maybe G is not even computable. So that's another issue, but I'm, I'm going to sidestep that a bit. Yes? Um, calibration? I don't know. I mean, th there may exist some examples where it looks like that. I think you can come up with examples where um, it might be like that, but I, I view it more like a simulation, I guess. Like, I'm just, I, I've only been given the output and I have to figure out what the output of the next one is. So I think of it more like simulation than calibration. Other questions? Yes? In this state, uh, I think we need more sensors, I think, because uh, H2 is a uh, little uh, big that uh, well, let's go back. So H, H2, H2 is the weak sensor. So H2 is the one with big pre images. No, I mean that uh, H1, uh, if we have H1, we need uh, more sensors uh, like H1, H1 to sensor all the environment. Yeah, very nice. That's right. H1 is more powerful. Right? But here's what I would like you to think about. Um, I'm going to you know, show you the most powerful sensor that you can get in a bit. It'll be very clear. But um, what I would like to figure out is starting with the task. Say your task is to explore the environment. Maybe it's to play pursuit evasion. Based on the task, I want to figure out what's the weakest sensor that can solve it. Then all the sensors that are more powerful can also solve it. Right? That's the kind of theory I want to set up. So I want to figure out the weakest. So I, I would like to have it so that I establish that H2 can solve it, you know, that H2 is sufficient in some system. And then, if that's the case, then I can also use H1 because of domination here, assuming that G is sort of efficiently computable. What's going to happen in reality, I think, and this, this corresponds very closely to what I see a lot in robotics. Like someone may take a, um, 
a really sophisticated laser scanner. They gather a huge amount of data and then have to do a bunch of computation, right? But if they had just used a simpler sensor, like H2, it may give them the information directly. So it's also useful in the other direction. It may suggest for you what sensor you can use that's cheaper. Then it feels like the physical world has done the computation for you, right? So it's tempting to start by gathering a lot of data and do a bunch of computation on it. Everybody says that. We're, we're now in the information age. Our, um, everything is data driven, right? There's, there's information on the web. Everyone wants to transform huge amounts of information. But I say, you know, for robotic systems, um, get the right sensor so that it measures exactly what you need so that you do not have to do the computation. So, so that's a kind of strange way of looking at it, but I think hopefully it's useful. Um, well, as we start comparing sensors now, we can start to arrange them in a chain. Right? We have a, um, um, a collection of sensors here um, arranged in a, in a chain from H1 to H5. Um, right? By saying H1 dominates H2, but H2 dominates H3, and so forth. I can go even further. Um, and make a sensor tree, I can say, okay, this is kind of hard to read. This is just some sensors that I've defined already, and they're defined in that tutorial paper. But um, certainly I can get a tree, right? Refinement is a partial ordering. Maybe I get a directed acyclic graph. Because I can have some sensor that is um, dominated by multiple others, right? So it could be a directed acyclic graph. Well, it turns out in general, you get something called a lattice. Um, and it, it can take, you can consider the lattice of partitions here. You get something called a partition lattice, and I, I will explain. Um, if I start with a set, say my set is really simple here, just one, two, three, four. This is called the partition lattice. Has anyone seen these before? Okay, well, I, but you've seen partitions, and you probably have seen lattices somewhere. So you can imagine what it looks like. Um, at the top, usually people write them the other way, but I like to write mine upside down. So. Um, at the top, I have the finest partition you can get. That's the partition into singletons. Right? So the, every, every set in the partition is just a unique element, single element. And then the bottom is the coarsest partition, right? It's just everything together. Um, somebody forgot to slice the bread here, right? So and at the top, it's been sliced as far as you can possibly slice it. No more slicing a lot, right? You're down to the quantum level of bread or something. Now, um, all of the stuff in the middle is intermediate, right? And you can see exactly in the diagram, like here, um, I can get this one by, 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 by slicing, uh, oh yeah, sorry, I can go this way by slicing the 2-4 slice to make 2 and 4 by themselves, right? I can go this way by slicing the 1-3 slice to make 1 and 3 by themselves, right? Um, notice that every pair here has what's called a greatest lower bound and a least upper bound. And this is called, this is a complete lattice, it turns out. So, uh, so basically everything will be defined here. Sometimes people call these meet and join. You may have learned it that way. I'm a bit older. I learned it as glib and love. So um, greatest lower bound, and, and it's hard to pronounce those, I guess. Glib and love. Um, so the least upper bound is like this. If I pick a pair of elements like these, I look at their lowest ancestor in this, in this structure, which is this one. So if I, if I take these two, any, any pair, I see these, then this is the least upper bound of them. And I can just turn the whole thing upside down to get the greatest lower bound. So I can take like this and this and figure out where we have to go, maybe down to here. Right? So, so every one of these, every pair has a unique uh, glue that loves. Is that okay? So that's just a generic definition, the lattice of partitions. And now I'm going to talk about something that I think is really pretty, which is um, the sensor lattice. So. I fix X, and then I think about all possible sensors that I can make of the form X goes to Y. But notice I'll leave Y as a variable, in the sense that, um, if you remember back here when I gave you two different sensors, um, for this example, I gave you two sensors with a Y1 and a Y2. So, so Y can be anything. I don't really care. Any kind of set. It could be a binary set. You know, it could be a set that's apple, orange, and pomegranate. I don't care. You know, some, some collection like that. So, uh, but, uh, 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 so any set is possible for y. I don't really care. So y is not fixed, but think about all possible functions like this. That's a ridiculously large set, right? Should be, for some given state speed. Uh, but I don't care. I'm not going to do probability theory on top of this or anything like that. So I can get away with this high level of generality and still show you an interesting structure. So here's the idea. Two sensors I will say are equivalent. I first want to make an equivalence relation. Have you done this before? And in, 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 some, in some cases of mathematics, it's very common to define an equivalence relation 
and then make a quotient space. You see this in group theory, you know, you, you can make quotient groups that way, you can see it in topology, you make quotient topologies. So very common to make quotients by defining an equivalence relation. And then when you're done, you get equivalence classes that are now your new elements, right? Well, that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to say two sensors are equivalent if and only if the partitions are identical. So I'm going to, I'm going to now do that. The reason why I'm doing that is because I, do, I no longer want to distinguish between sensors that slice the bread the same way. I would just say they are the same sensor. I don't really care, right? So if my one sensor outputted one, two, three, and my other sensor outputted apples, oranges, and pomegranates, I don't care, right? As long as they have the same three images, it's the same, right? So if I do that, all I care about is the partition of x. Right? The partition of x is the, um, the sensor as far as I'm concerned. Now, here's an even bigger crazy set. Let's look at the set of all partitions of, of x. That's going to be really a set of all possible sensors now, right? right? All partitions. So if, if my state space were only this, then this is all possible sensors, right? Does that make sense? Without a joke, does it make sense that this is all sensors? So, um, um, so these would be all the possibilities. If you have a, a, an interesting state space, a really big one like we typically consider, this is some uncountable infinite collection, right? It's a very big collection. But it has very nice structure to it. So let me show you. Uh, so all sensor models are in this lattice somewhere, once I start with a state space. And if I look at the top and the bottom of this, of this remember what I did from last time? You remember when I gave you the bijective sensor and the dummy sensor? Right, the dummy sensor always outputs the same thing. So what does that correspond to? Well, if I go back to the lattice here, that corresponds to being here, right? The dummy sensor sits at the bottom. That feels good, right? It should. Um, the bijective sensor sits at the top. Okay. So what does that mean in terms of my, um, uh, my notion of domination, right? When one sensor is better than another. I think it means that all of these sensors in here can be simulated by the one on top, right? However, if you can solve your problem using this sensor, you can use any sensors above it if you want. You can use this one, or this one, or the one up there. You can use anything above it that, it, that, that has its ancestors, and you'll be fine if you can do the computation gene. Um, so it's a very helpful structure. So, I, so I'd like you to just think about this. Um, um, this is not a popular thing. This is just something I, I, I made up and I like, so I, I don't know, but, but, um, but I, I really find it very helpful for we're thinking about how sensors are related here and such, and so it's a, it's a big part of the things that will be coming. Um, all right, are there questions about that? Does that seem okay? So that gives a very powerful way to arrange all sensors, which is amazing to me. Um, questions? Yeah? How do you put that like the color camera and the monochrome camera? color camera and just see if it can work into it? Yeah, I, I, guess that would, I guess that would work, right? So uh, let's see, if I'm thinking about cameras, um, so I still have to start with some state space, and then I think about the color camera. The color camera probably is up higher than the than the uh, monochrome camera, right? The grayscale camera, and the grayscale camera should be able to, um, yeah, if you can derive what gray pixel you should observe from the color ones, then it should work. However, it will not work in reality because of noise and different kinds of lenses and all kinds of other stuff, right? But if we live in a pure theoretical world here. If the grayscale value is derivable from the color value, then everything should work like this. That's right. And you can imagine there's going to be a set of different environments, like maybe I wear a red shirt or a blue shirt, and it happens to have the same gray value, and there's no way you can tell the difference. So that's that's the difference that's, that's due to this refinement that I was talking about. Other questions? Yeah. Okay. Other questions? All right. Um, I want to now make the sensors a little more complicated. I want to show you all of these concepts I've talked about can be extended in some ways. So I want to do a little bit of that, and then I will get to the next part of the tutorial, which is called filtering. Uh, which filtering means combining observations, well, combining multiple observations somehow. So I have either multiple sensors or the same sensor, which produces multiple observations. Somehow I get a bunch of observations and want to combine them. But before I get to that, I want to introduce some more complications on our, regular, on our ordinary sensor model. So up to now, everything I've done has involved this model, just h goes from x to y. Maybe you don't like that, right? Maybe that seems too restrictive. No sensor behaves like that. Well, 
it's still okay. I think that it's reasonable as a, as, a, as a model for analysis, but I just want to say how to handle other kinds of complications here. Just a little bit. All right. Well, here's how a non-deterministic sensor mapping might look. Um, you wanted to think about many-to-many -many mappings, perhaps? So I could say this. Maybe for every state, I get an element of the power set of observations. All I can name is there's going to be a set of observations, right? Uh, if that's the case, then I can change the pre-image definition. Instead of having equals here, I have element of. It's the only change in the definition. So pre-image looks exactly the same, but I have element of here because this is a set, right? It's kind of like we just jumped from deterministic finite automata to non-deterministic finite automata. You know, somewhere there's a, a couple of small changes where you get element of instead of equals. So because it's a set of possible observations now. If I look at the bread slices here, the bread kind of gets messed up, right? So what happens here is that I get a covering of the space, not a partition. It's kind of like each slice of bread now is getting bloated. It's getting larger. And it overhangs with the other slices. That's, that's, you don't get a clean partition anymore. So that's one way to look at it is a, is a covering. I'll give some examples of that. Um, let's see, I could have a one-dimensional position sensor. Keep it simple, right? So I'm on the real number line. And um, maybe I have errors that are, that are up to epsilon. So my sensor up there, H of X, will give me, I don't know, some set of Ys such that the distance between X and Y is less than epsilon, right? So that's how the sensor mapping might look now. That'd be a good deterministic sensor. And then if I want to think of the pre-image, I try to figure out where I'm at based on that observation. It's this set here, right? I, if I observe 2, I will be at 2 plus or minus epsilon. Right? Somewhere within that interval, 2 minus epsilon and 2 plus epsilon. The pre-images would look like this. They're very interesting. They look almost the same as that, right? But that's how the pre-images look here. Um, it'll still be that x minus y is less than or equal to epsilon. And that's, that's where we'll end up. So that makes a cover of R. Right, you have all these intervals covering R uh, quite densely, let's say, right? In fact, there's an infinite number of sets at every element. And so that's quite a, quite, a, quite a mess compared to the original nice slices of bread. Um, or you could argue there's a bunch of bread stacked up, if you like, you know, but it's an infinite collection, so it's quite a mess. Um, here's some examples. I can make a, a faulty binary detection sensor. I like this. So if, you have, if you're using non-deterministic uncertainty, and you have a binary sensor, so its only job is to produce a zero or a one. And it's not even good at doing that, let's say, right? It's going to be a, not a very useful sensor, right? So what happens there is, imagine I have a, I can have false positives, so I could say, uh, maybe I'm doing detection. So that's supposed to be a detection sensor. I just have a visibility region V like this, right? And then uh, maybe the body that I'm trying to detect is inside or outside. So there's a body here. I'm trying to detect, is it inside or is it outside, right? I don't know which one. And so um, a false positive would mean it returns one even though the body's outside. False negative means it returns zero even though the body's inside. Well, if that's the case, I get a double covering of X. That's all it's going to do. Because it basically says that this sensor might give a zero or a one regardless of, the, um, of whether the body is inside or outside. Is that right? So that looks completely useless. But the, the, the pre-images give a double cover because every pre-image, the, the pre-images I get for this, each pre-image, pre-image is defined like, oops, not that one. Uh, the pre-image is defined like this. Each pre-image is all of X for that example. So it turns out that a non-deterministic binary detection sensor, I'll just say intuitively here, is equivalent to the dummy sensor, right? It's not giving you any useful information. Kind of if we add probabilities to it, then it can become useful. Um, inaccurate directional depth. So I can take, I can go through all of these sensors above and make, let's say, non-deterministic versions, right, where some kind of errors are happening. So feel free to do that. We can do that. Um, um, I won't go through too many details of that, though. I think. Um, oh, and we can take the sensor lattice and the idea of domination, and we can extend it to the non-deterministic case. Um, I'm not going to go through the details of that. It turns out we're not satisfied with our definitions of it for that. Um, uh, in that context, too many sensors end up being not comparable. There's not enough domination for the definition we end up with. But, but I'd be happy to talk with you about some of those things if you're curious. Uh, all right. Here's the probabilistic case. Maybe I have a model like this. I say I have a probability distribution over possible y's given x. That should look very related to the previous one. Instead of getting a set of possible x's, 
I get some values associated with each element, right? Because it's probability. So the only difference now between the previous model and this one is that I just add some probability distribution on top of the set of possible observations. Is that fine? Okay, so that's how that one should look. Um, you can simulate the, um, yeah, you, in the non-deterministic case, uh, maybe just say that the probability is zero for everything outside of the H of X. Right? So that's how it would look related to the non-deterministic case. Um, so for example, I can make a probabilistic one-dimensional sensor that looks like this, right? That's a Gaussian noise model, and I said, okay, here's where I'm actually at, and here's the distribution of observations that I will get. That's a very standard way to define sensor models in robotics. Most people probably will wonder why I go through more than 100 slides before I get to that. You know, they would like to just start with that on slide one, right? So that's the model, there's nothing else, right? But there's all of the structure that I gave you in these other uh, virtu uh, virtual sensor models that, that I think really help a lot to characterize what's going on, what information you're getting, and so forth. So, um, so this is fine, but uh, it's important to think about how it's related to the previous uh, concepts. <coughs> I can make a multi-dimensional version of that, no big deal, right? So, it, um, <coughs> I can make a probabilistic detector now. So this is, again, just like this example I was giving, are you inside or outside? The V here corresponds to this mat, let's say, that you step on. Um, so I can have some probabilities here, right? I can say, okay, P, the probability that Y equals 1 given that P is not in V is the false positive probability. I can get a false negative probability. And if these two probabilities are very small, then this becomes a useful sensor, correct? It's going to give you some kind of information. You can take expectations and all sorts of things, and it's very nice. So, so just something to point out. If I do have probability mass that I can put down, then I can get more information. And the only reason why that's happening, I think, is because there's a lot of information that's encoded in the probability distribution. It implies that you've been doing experiments, right? You've been watching how this behaves maybe for, for a month, and then you have good statistics so that you can reliably predict the future. So, so you're, you're helping undo some of the uncertainty. Uh, probabilistic directional depth, same thing. You know, you just have a, I now have a probability distribution over the distances. It's like having a Gaussian across here. So you can do that as well. Um, any questions about that? So that's, that's how we add disturbances. What I should show you now is the sensor lattice for this case. Uh, I should show you non-deterministic ones and, and probabilistic ones. And I will say that those are uh, work in progress. I don't have good... Good ones. Um, there is a really interesting idea that's due to um, um, Blackwell, a famous statistician who was at the University of California, Berkeley, um, for comparison of experiments. And, and he talked about experiments which are much like sensors here, and, and the fact that you can compare one sensor, or one, one experiment to another, and get a very nice definition in the probabilistic setting for when one is better than another. It seems, it feels very intuitively close to the things that we developed for um, the, the sensor lattice before here. But uh, we don't have a formal connection as of yet, but I'm working with some colleagues at Illinois, uh, one guy, Maxime Roginsky, and others there, and, and uh, we're trying to find connections. I, I think there are really nice, uh, let's say, statistic or probabilistic analogs to the sensor lattice that I showed you. But, uh, but I, my guess is that they still will not be as, as clean and beautiful as the, the sensor lattice, because that one does not require measure theory or anything. It requires no probability um, definitions to, 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 to make. All right, um, here's the next family I like. What if I take sensors and I make them right over a state, uh, what is it called, state time space, right? State, oh, not space time, so it should be state time uh, for the title of the slide. Uh, state time space. So if I do that, what the heck is going on here, right? So remember the space Z we can make. And uh, it's quite weird, right? So I can, how does that work? So I have my space Z. Remember, Z looks something like this. I have uh, X and T here. So that's the way Z looks. That's my whole space Z. And now what? I'm somewhere in here, and my sensor gives an output, right? It's really odd. So, so maybe I get what, partitions of Z, right? Isn't that strange? So I can make a mapping from Z to Y. So in other words, over time, the observations I get might change, right? And if I look at the pre-images, that means I'm slicing up this. Isn't that really, really weird? So but that's the right way to think about it. So maybe I have a partition of this. Right? Some kind of partition of this. And um, and, and that's the um, what the heck does that mean? It looks like I have a piece of the what we call the space-time continuum or something. I don't know. We have a piece of the, the state time space, 
that all produces the same observation. So if you were to get the observation, all you could tell is something about the state and something about the time simultaneously, right? It's really cool. So somehow it's telling you something about both. Um, so here's a very simple example. I have a perfect clock, so it just tells me the time. Right? Um, maybe I can put a timestamp. Actually, one thing you can do with the sensor is you can put a timestamp on every one of the um, um, on every one of the um, observations that you got from the previous sensor. So any of these sensors I have above, I can just stick a timestamp on them. That's kind of boring. It's a boring way to use these sensors, but I can do that. Um, so, for example, I have this very simple detection sensor. I just put T on it, so when I get the observations, I know what time it occurred. And I can use that information. Um, you know, there's one more sensor I really like. I'm tempted to. I don't have a slide for it, but I really, I really like this example a lot. Let me see if I can to really illustrate how weird. These, these are kind of simple examples, but there's one that's really kind of weird and interesting. I think I can show you this. Um, I'm a little bit scared. Let me see if I can present this thing, thing nicely. Um, sort of wanting to make a figure of it. So, let's see how this works. This one really amazes me. I, I think this is fun. So suppose we are on a planet at the equator, right? So, um, so we're here somewhere, um, right? So we're, we're standing on the equator on a planet. The planet is rotating, and then over here, um, there's a sun shining, right? Now, um, I'm going to talk about time and state here. Let's say the only state information that's important is the longitude. Where are you on the, on the planet? Right? So let's say that's here. So that's, this is position on the planet this way. Right? So that's your longitude. Longitude. And this is going to be the time, but I'll only make it be the time in terms of a 24-hour day. Or whatever the period of revolution of that strange planet is. I don't know. But you know just, um, so in other words, time is circular. If, if, if when the planet comes back, I would just say that's the same time, right? Otherwise, um, they'll look like a helix or something, and I don't know. It's, a, it's, just, it's just a circle. So that means that um, here you have um, time with respect to, that is not readable, um, the rotation of the planet, right? So, so that's what you have there. Um, if that's the case, first let's think about topology. So you had some topology before. If this is a circle, and this is a circle, what is Z? Not a sphere. It's two-dimensional, so not a cube. It's a torus. The torus, thank you very much. Yeah, that's right. So it's torus, because this wraps around first, let's say, so that makes this a, a cylinder, and then I take the two ends and I put it together to make the surface of a donut, if you want, right? So make a torus. Um, so in, in topology notation, we can write this as this. Now these are the same. And this is the same as this, right? So that's how you would write it with kind of topological notation. You can read some of these things in my book. I have a page with figures of all the different two-dimensional manifolds that you can get like this. Well, not all of them, but the interesting ones, the basic ones. Um, all right, so I have all of that now. I'm on a torus here. Isn't that weird? And now, let's suppose I have a binary sensor, right? We're sitting here. We've been maybe kidnapped and dropped on the planet somewhere. We don't know where we are, right? But we're given a sensor that detects whether or not it's light or dark. The binary sensor. So if that's the case, what's it going to make here? Um, it's, it's light or dark means you only get two pre-images, right? There's the light pre-image and the dark pre-image. And it's weird because it's simultaneously, if I get an observation, it's light. That will tell you something simultaneously about what time it is and where you are, right? Isn't that weird? So I think it's very nice. It's like, it's like these things are coupled. I don't think people really exploit this too much, but a, a very simple example like this brings it up. I'm not really sure which way it goes here. I, I, I think I reasoned it out, and I think it's something like this. Like, like this is something like light, and this is dark, and this is the same as that because they're all connected together. I think it's something like that. I don't know. I, I could be wrong. Maybe it goes the other way. You have to try to figure it out if you want. But, um, but it's really amazing. So, so you actually get a torus that's been sliced into two pieces um, that correspond to the pre-images for this weird, simple example. The reason why I like the example is because, as I said, again, you simultaneously learn something about where you are and what time of, and, and what, the, what the time is with regard to the planet's rotation. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? So, 
right. Any questions about that? I want to go to the largest family of sensors. And let's see, how much am I going to do on that? Oh, good. Okay, let me just finish this bit and then I'll do a, and I'll do a, um, a break. Um, here's the largest family of the sensors, which is history based. So there's a trajectory up there, which is a function from the entire time interval into the space space. I, I defined trajectory already, I think. And now I have this x tilde, which is the set of all state trajectories. So all possible trajectories, huge set. Now I make a history based sensor map that says, based on the trajectory, I predict what the observation is going to be. Is that okay? So that means you can use your history now. Um, an odometer is like that, right? Like the odometer in your car that tells how many kilometers you have driven so far is based on everything you've done. Right? So that's the way to think about these. Um, you can do pre-images all over again here. You can say, okay, I have pre-images um, because I just look at all trajectories that could have produced the same observation. It turns out I get a partition of the space of trajectories from that. And I can make a sensor lattice over the space of trajectories, which is crazy. So all that sensor lattice stuff works beautifully for this. I should have said the sensor lattice stuff works beautifully for uh, this stuff as well, because I, I, get a, I, get a, I get a sensor lattice over Z, believe it or not. So you can get it over Z, or you can get it over X tilde, which is the space of all trajectories. So that's pretty amazing. Let me give just a couple of examples of these. And these are very closely related to filtering, which is a nice transition to what's coming next. So as I said, you can have an odometer like in your car. So that's why I wrote an integral here. It just integrates over the entire history of how fast you can go. And this is the V there, the velocities. Right, so I just take the speed. I enter, the integrand is just the speed. I integrate the speed and I figure out how far I've gone. Oh, sorry, that one's a, well, I guess that's OK. I don't know why it's data some zero. But it looks like it should be something else for a linear odometer. Um, but anyway, it's just odometry. And have, yeah, that's right. It should be a, like x of zero or something. Or just start with zero to the minute. Um, I have an angular odometer which is like this. I integrate theta dot. Um, this is also useful for I can have a delayed measurement, right? So by using the history, I can say the observation is the state from one second ago. So if you want to in introduce delays into your measurements, a lot of people say delays are everywhere, right? It seems like it. They are actually in practice. Then um, this is how you can introduce delay. You can use these kind of sensors. You just have to look at what the observation was a second ago. Otherwise, it's undefined. This means undefined um, if in the first second. It's not a time yet. And I can do it in discrete time, and it just becomes like a summation instead of an integral. Um, all right, so let me finish this part, and then we can take a quick break. Um, I did physical sensors and their characteristics. I want you to think about the difference between a virtual sensor, which is a mathematical model, and how these might be implemented in practice. I need a lot of families, depth, detection, relational, gap, field families. Remember that uncertainty fundamentally comes from the pre-images. I gave this pretty sensor lattice, and then I talked about different kinds of complications, like disturbances, or sensors over state, time, space, and history, uh, or history-based ones which use the entire state trajectory. So here's what I want to say in the later parts, is that to make filters and then planning algorithms on top of that, you need to find the right virtual sensors for your test. I gave you a catalog to think about. And that's how I'd like you to think when you, when you approach problems in, in robotics or computational geometry type questions that are inspired by robotics. I, I encourage you to think about the catalog if you want. Even better, make your own catalog, right? Invent some new families that are appropriate for whatever you're thinking about. That would be the best. But if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're just starting, think about these All right, questions. All right, we'll take, a, we'll take a break for a bit. People are looking tired. The second day already, huh? What's going to happen on day five? They're going to be. I will be sleeping on the desk.